Spontaneous Yacht Insurance. G'day and welcome to Casting Off with Confidence. I'm Jackie Parry and today I have with me Tracy Ayris. Now, Tracy describes herself as an over 50 gypsy. She wears many hats. I'll tell you about a few of them. She's a sailing photojournalist. She's a racing sailor. She's a tourism consultant, a customer experience consultant, a writer, a TV producer, world traveler, and this impresses me the most, a herder of cats. I have to warn you, she's very impetuous, makes impetuous decisions about traveling. And one of those was in her 40s and on a whim, and in her words, a little foolishly, she volunteered to be crew on the Adelaide to Lincoln Blue Water Yacht Race. She has a six mojito mindset at times and has been known to leap off tourist boats. She has sort of got herself into, uh, smoothed her way into visiting first class resorts um, as a travel writer. And I must admit, Tracy, I've, I've used that trick once or twice myself. Two decades ago, she had some goals. I want to do the seven seas, and she's on target to do that. Tracy, that's really impressive. Impressive, you've only got the Arctic to go. And when Tracy's not working, my God, how does she get time? She's on her yacht, fulfilling her dreams as a blue water cruiser, which is where we find you now, Tracy. Oh my goodness, that's exhausting. Yes, it was a long intro. Thank you, Jackie. Yes, I'm sitting in Sid Harbour in the beautiful Whit Sundays right now. Very, mm. very lucky to be here at the time. Uh, at the time we're recording, of course, with Sydney and lockdown and all those horrible things around Australia at the moment and the world. Uh, I feel very blessed. You certainly are. It's beautiful up there and well done getting up there and fulfilling your dreams. I want to know how you got there a little bit first. There's lots to talk about. You have an incredible life. I'm, I'm in admiration of what you do and your skill set. So it started off with this race, I believe. And, and I think in your words, you were a rookie. So can you tell us a bit more about um, how you got to do that race and, and a bit about what happened? Uh, well, I started basically, I, uh, the way I started sailing was uh, my partner at the time uh, I had three months long service leave at my work. I was working for Channel 7 at the time. And he said, go and do something you've always wanted to do. So I took off to Sydney and I learned to sail on one of those sort of day skipper kind of courses on the harbour. Came back to Adelaide and then thought I might sail in Adelaide and joined the Cruising Yacht Club of South Australia, which I'm still a member of 25 years later or whatever. Um, and I started on a racing boat. And not long after I'd started to learn to race, they have the yearly uh, race to Port Lincoln. And I put my hand up and said, sure, I'll do that. It turned out to be one of the worst races conditions wise that they'd had for many, many, many years. And when we got to Port Lincoln, I was one of only three out of 14 on the boat that was actually up and smiling. Uh, everyone else was comatose down the bottom, throwing up. It was terrible. I was passing up hats full of, uh, yeah, you, you don't need to know that. But anyway, um, and that really made me realise that I could do this racing thing. And since then, uh, racing has taken me around the world, really. Uh, I did the ARC in 2003 from Africa to the Caribbean, uh, writing for Australian Yachting Magazine at this time. And so I combined my learning of my, well, as I learnt my racing with my love of writing. And so I wrote from the perspective of somebody that um, wasn't an expert, you know, it was sort of a bit of a warts and all kind of writing when I would write my articles. So I'm not writing from the purest point of view. I'm writing from somebody that loves to write and somebody that's enjoying the adventure. And I think that was a bit of the difference with some of my writing. And from that I became, I was asked to work on some regattas, helping to write some stories for regattas and photograph uh, some of the racing. It's sort of taken me around the world. I covered a few uh, overseas regattas, and, but I always had a full-time job at Channel 7 as a, new, well, for then a news director and later a senior producer. So I did what I could around my real job. Fantastic. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a quick progression and a steep learning curve. Uh, we're very much kindred spirits, let me tell you. What happened in that race? What were the conditions you had? And why do you 
why do you think you were okay? Like everyone else was, was vomiting and I being think sick. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. And I was only, uh, there was only uh, two women on the boat uh, at the, and the rest were obviously all men and not saying this is gender specific. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I was lucky, but I, I have to say I've been through um, force 10 gales on end in the Atlantic and I've, ne and I just don't, I don't get seasick. I'm very lucky. Um, so for some reason, and I don't know why, and there's no real correlation to that because when I was a child, I would be very car sick. So the two don't necessarily marry up. Um, so I just don't get seasick. Um, I can cook below. I can, I'm fine below decks in any conditions. And I think that's, that's, um, I'm very lucky. You know, I know, mm -hmm. I don't know why I can't explain it. And I think that's one of the reasons why I enjoy sailing so much because, you know, I'm not very often very miserable, um, even in the worst conditions. So mm -hmm. uh, that's fantastic. Um, most of the time I'm not seasick, but there's certainly conditions that will get me and it's uh, the worst feeling in the world, really. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so uh, that's really great. And what were the condition conditions you had oh, in that race? Um, oh, 30 to 40 knots on the nose, basically bashing down uh, St. Vincent Gulf all the way around to the bottom of York Peninsula, mm -hmm. where we then turn and go across what we call the foot, because York Peninsula is shaped like a foot. So you go down the Gulf, if anyone knows South Australia, down the Gulf, around the foot, and then generally around the heel, um, you sort of crack, uh, get far up a kite and off you go up to um, Port Lincoln. Um, but around the foot, it's pretty much Southern Ocean. And um, yeah, it was pretty horrendous. Big rollers, just just pounding into the, mm -hmm. you know, the crashing short chop, uh, con really confused seas, um, just terrible conditions for racing, really. Just you don't really want to be out in it. And we were on a 40 foot far um, at the time. That's what I was racing on at the time. And she was a strong boat. Mm. Uh, but she wasn't the biggest, fastest boat, but she was a very strong boat. And um, we won the race on IRC that year. So that was my yeah, first, first, yeah, so very first introduction to racing or a, a passage race as, as compared to around the cans racing. Yeah. That's fantastic. First race, you, you, uh, you, you win the race. And not only that, you have some great training along the way and realise that it mm. wasn't such a foolish idea to put your hand up and go. Yeah, now, well, up until we bought this boat, which was last year, I was still racing with the same crew, same skipper. Fantastic. Oh, that's great. And I can really appreciate what you say. Like, it wasn't a, a big boat, but she was a strong boat. Uh, my experience of our few boats we've had, the smaller boat was the better boat. Certainly more seaworthy. Yeah, sea kindly boats are the way to go. They might look, those pretty ones don't necessarily equate to being sea kindly, do they? No, that's absolutely right. I couldn't agree more. So I can see through your, your blog and your travels that over the years you went overseas on different excursions and, and we might come back to some of the places you went to, but I'm really keen to talk about your boating now because that has led you to buying your own boat and cruising. And with that experience, that's shaped the type of boat you've looked for. So can you tell us about your boat now, the glorious name she has, and, and what made you choose her? Uh, the boat chose us, actually, but we had selected, we, it was my dream boat. So I'll take you back to the beginning of COVID when uh, I live on the marina uh, in Adelaide in South Australia and, and Matthew, my partner and I, we were kayaking around. We were in semi-lockdown. It was really early in the whole COVID thing. And uh, we'd put the kayaks in and we'd kayak around and we were looking for a boat and we'd been looking for a while, um, but we, you know, the funds weren't quite there. And Matthew's six foot eight. So that dictates immediately well, what yeah. sort of boat that you're going to buy. So clearly anything under 40 foot was never going to work for us at all. So um, we, picked, we were kayaking around and I saw a boat in the marina and I looked at it and I said, that is the most beautiful boat. Like if I could have any boat, this is the boat. And it was a 470, Catalina 470. Uh, and we looked at it and uh, the guy poked his head out and said, oh, you know, had a, had a chat. And I said, oh, I love your boat. It would be my dream boat. And we couldn't afford it at the time. Uh, fast forward to many fruitless attempts to buy boats, but we mm. decided on Catalinas because they have a lot of headroom. Um, and the 470, they only made uh, less than 200 of them in America. Uh, at the, and they are known to be a very strong blue water boat as compared to other Catalinas that are mm. coastal, more coastal cruising. This boat is built to cross oceans. And this one has, she's been around the world. Um, so we chose a Catalina and we lusted after the 470, but thought it was beyond us at the time. And then 
fast forward, as I said, uh, through COVID and another year of COVID and funds have built up and um, through serendipitously, we found this boat. Um, another Australian was basically he, Dale, the previous owner, brought it back to Australia after running the gauntlet of COVID from Mexico. He was over, he was on his round the world trip and COVID cut his round the world trip short. He sailed it back to Australia via Fiji and Matthew was following him on the cruiser forums. And at one stage he said he wanted to sell the boat. And as soon as he got landed back in Australia, we emailed him and said, are you still thinking of selling the boat? And he said, absolutely. Today I decided to sell it. If you can get up here, I won't send it to a broker. Come up and have a look at it. And we jumped on the next plane to Brisbane and we bought it that day. Wow. Well done. So you sort of so the boat found us. And, Yeah. <laughs> She found us and she's a beautiful boat and Dale had looked after her very well. Um, she's done some miles, you know, if you look closely, you'll see, um, you know, that she's not perfect, but she is a 20 year old boat, but she's um, very, very well built. Uh, and she has exactly the things that I wanted in a boat in the layout as well. So mm -hmm. I wanted an aft cabin. I don't want a V berth. Um, I, Matthew needs to be able to walk through here. Yeah. He needs to be high enough for him yeah. to walk through without stooping and hitting his head. Um, so this boat is a two cabin, two head bathroom uh, layout, not three. And there's only the two of us and very rarely will we have guests. So it suits us. We don't need a three cabin layout. We don't have lots of children to bring on board. Um, I've only got one son. Um, and the other thing is the bathrooms on these boats have separate showers mm. rather than standing in the bathroom and do, using that as your shower, these have separate enclosures, which I love because you're just wiping down a little shower enclosure instead of the whole bathroom every now and then. Yeah. Um, so it has a lot of attributes that I love and a cockpit rather than the two sides that you might find in a cruising boat. Yeah. Generally, uh, Catalinas have the extra bit where uh, they have a higher ladder, but it means you can sit across the boat. The, the cushions go around the cockpit all the way around. Okay. So you can both sit in the cockpit on, and one person on the high side and the other person on the high side with their legs low. So you can both stretch out uh, rather than one person rolling off the high side and one person being on the low side. So the, the U-shaped um, yes. cushions configuration in the, in the cockpit, it's the best of both worlds. Uh, twin wheel um, and open mm -hmm. transom. So twin wheels so that we've got a redundancy if there's a steering cable breakage, the other oh, wheel works, yes. it's independent. Mm. Um, yes, and the uh, open transom, so the walkthrough steps straight off the back. So she had all the things that we were looking for, which uh, we can get uh, 16 people in our cockpit. Oh. So <laughs> we've done it. So sundowners are great on this boat. Oh, so fantastic. That's, well, that's and, um, and yeah, and fully enclosed on top too. So from yeah. the Dodger to the infield to the Bimini, she's fully enclosed. And we don't have her fully enclosed at the back at, as yet mm. um, because we're going to be putting a hard Dodger on her eventually and then doing the whole clears again. So we're yeah. not worrying about it. But we do have clears on our, either side back to the steering wheels mm. on each side, port and starboard, so we can stop a lot of the breeze coming in on the sides. Um, and we have a drop-down shade at the back when the sun's setting off the transom for sundowners and we can put the shade down so it stops the sun coming in the back. So she's These got are... a lot of things about her. She was set up very well. Um, yes. And uh, we've added a few things. So uh, there's a few things I'd still like, but there's always, there always is, isn't there? Oh, there always is. But I think that's the beauty of having a boat that's done a few miles. Those things have been thought of, like, you know, mm. the shade is extremely important. That shelter is extremely important. We did the same. We put a, a hard dodger on and, and did some enclosing as well. And and I remember with our first boat, we we sort of laid down the cockpit. We wanted to be able to make sure we could lay down in the cockpit. So when we're on those watches, you could have a, a quick power nap or at least change yes. position, do something. Yes. So they're incredibly yes. important with the, the, the cruising lifestyle. So you, when you were at sea or, well, let's just say generally living on board, you use your aft cabin, that's your sleeping quarters. What have you got in the forward cabin? It's a Pullman. So it's a Pullman. So basically the aft cabin is a master cabin with a full queen bed, yep. walk around. And I take the, and the, um, the sofa here or the lounge settee in the saloon, um, the cushions from that I stack on the side and use them to roll against when we're on uh, under passage because there's only one of us obviously two-handed so um, so I don't need a lee cloth I just stack the two cushions mm -hmm. from here on the sides and that stops me Great. you know uh, that works well and then here uh, going forward it's a pullman with the bed to port 
mm-hmm. and walk through to the um, other ensuite, or the you know shower and head at, the, at basically in the V. Mm-hmm. So that's the layout of the boat. And the other thing this boat has is a huge galley, lots of bench space. Nice. So a lot of the production boats uh, I know have are very limited in their bench space. So, you know, you'd be cooking and you've got to move everything to go back into the fridge or back into the freezer. Um, I'm blessed that this has got um, really good bench space, this, the galley in this, mm. in this boat. So that was another factor as well. Right. Are you full-time liverboards or uh, full-time for a certain amount of time, if you see what I mean? Um, we left we left South Australia in June with the idea to come up here, do a few months on the wet Sundays, and then go back. Um, now we won't be taking the boat back to South Australia. She'll probably stay up here. Mm-hmm. Um, Matthew will stay with the boat. I may fly back. I've still I've got a house and a cat and a son in Adelaide, um, but I can work anywhere. So mm-hmm. at the moment, so I'm not. I don't have a 24 hour you know a, a 40 hour a week job. Um, so I work as a consultant so I can take on projects and work remotely. So, um, and that's a lot of, you know, a bit of writing, a bit of content creation, um, you know, different clients in different fields. So I think I'll probably go back to and uh, we'll probably live on the boat up here for, for the foreseeable future anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, with the long-term goal that then I'll rent my house out in Adelaide and live aboard full-time, which um, in the meantime is probably, it was pretty much what we're doing now. And what, So you're going to be spending a lot of time on the boat. It's a fabulously set up boat already. And, and that's why you were following the boat and, and the boat found you. What are the real differences? You started off as a racer and then gone to cruising. What are the differences um, with doing the two different things. For me, they were very different. I did it the other way around, but what did you find? Um, well, we're combining them. We actually have a really good asymmetric spinnaker on the boat. So we run our assy. Um, it is in a sock, which I've never really used much, except on that arc race I mentioned, we had socks on that boat, but I've never really used a sock. Um, but for the two of us, the sock works really well. We've got two spinnaker poles and we've also got a code zero. So um, we run our code zero when the right weather. So I think we probably, um, given the racing background, and Matthew races on TP52s, he's a, he's a racer, has raced for many years. So I, given that, we're not against putting the kite up or putting the zero up if the conditions are right. So um, we're not two, two sail cruisers. We, we, do, we do carry them. We've also got a spare jib on board as well. Um, so we've got a, we've got a lot of sails on this boat. I have to say when I think about it for a cruising boat, but and the uh, but the assy is is great. Um, we've run it a couple of times and we really really like it. When we've got the right conditions, the boat goes beautifully with the assy mm-hmm. and the code zero. So different conditions, different sails. Um, so we do run those. So I suppose that's where the racing meets the cruising. Matthew's put telltales on the sails. You know, so you can see how the sails are streaming, even though we have in mass furling and we know we're never going to get a perfect shape out of the sail all the time. But, um, you know, if uh, it, we probably tweak a lot more than a lot of mm. cruisers, um, I would say, given the racing background. But other than that, you know, she isn't a fast boat. She's a big, she's just a big, heavy cruising mm. boat, really. So she's not actually going to break any speed records, but she's very sea kindly. She gets along well under sail and we, we enjoy sailing her. Yeah, and that's good. Yeah, I found that, um, well, well, I'm not a racer. I've done two races. But aside from that, I found that I, I preferred the, the heavier, the heavy displacement um, boats. And yes, they are slower. But when you're out in those conditions in that blue water cruising, it's, um, it, I find it a better place to, do, to be more. I'm more confident and happy knowing I've got this tough little boat that's going to survive and I dare say you've uh, been liverboards now you've loaded her up a little bit so that would affect your speed as well she came with a lot of stuff to actually um mm. she's full with we actually were out we we're at a bait reef yesterday and we went diving um she has you know scuba tanks um on board and a dive compressor so we can fill the tanks she also has a hooker so it's a bit of a redundancy mm. we've got you know if just if that's we've got dive tanks and a hooker um so we've got a lot of bits and pieces like that on board and we've just bought an e-scooter <laughs> So that's the other thing that uh, we're really excited about, an e-scooter, which was great. I mean, Early Beach, I can just, you know, j- jumped on board the scooter and went over to Cannonvale to the very good butcher 
that pre-cryovac and freezes down your meat for you. There's another tip for anybody in the Wit Sunday. Mm. Um, to the MB, MBW butcher at Cannonvale at the Coles there. If you ask them in your order and you can portion up your meats and they'll put it in a cryovac and they'll freeze it down so you're not using your freezer to freeze it down. So I just get on the e-scooter with a little basket and off I go and uh, it's great. Yeah, so it, it, that's another thing that's in the cupboard in there. <laughs> So, the cupboard. so we've got a few <laughs> things that we've added to the boat. Um, yeah. in the, it's in the cupboard. Um, we also carry two outboards at the moment. So we've got, and it came, they came with the boat day. As I said, Dale had set the boat up really well. So we've got a four horsepower and we've got a 15. So when okay. we're just running around, we'll use the four and the 15 lives in the aft cabin with us <laughs> on its bracket on the, it's got a bracket mounted to the wall and I use it to drape my dressing gown on. Um, <laughs> but um, we deploy that when we want to do some real serious, you know, from longer distance cruising in the dinghy. So yeah. we've got the, got the alternative. Uh, we've got a, an arch on the back where we store the dinghy, but we don't use it for passages very often. Only short passages. We'll put Good. it on the davits. Um, other than that, it's on the foredeck always for long passages. Um, and Is it a yeah, rib? So very well set up. Yeah. Is it a rib or hard dinghy? What have you got? Hard bottom rib. Mm. Not only yeah, so it's a rib, but it's a hard bottom. Um, so and it seems to have it's perfect. But well, it's. It's the right size just for the two of us and the motors that we have. It's perfect. So, um, you know, there are bigger industrial dinghies, but also the weight's a factor. I think yeah. the capacity that what we've got, this one works really well for us. It's a mercury um, rib. And uh, so far it's been fantastic. Yeah, no, I can appreciate what you're saying there. So talking of the weight of things, um, I know when we had, uh, we on our second boat, we cap it, carried a couple of eight horsepower engines and they were sort of heavy enough how do you go with lifting um so you've come up to your boat you're gonna stow away your motor and your dinghy how do you do that how do you get your motor up well the four is easy matthew just undoes it and hands it to me and like this literally grabs it by the arm and hands it to me and <laughs> i'm on the transom and i'll hand it and i'll put it on the and then we'll, you know screw it yeah. down so the four is no problem the 15, um, we use one of the uh, pulleys for the davits and we've got a harness on it. So okay. I'll pull it up. So mm -hmm. Matthew will undo it. I'll pull it up. We'll, I'll hold it. He'll get on the boat. We'll lift it onto the, um, we've got another bo you know, mounting board on the, and we'll wash, you know, give it a rinse out or whatever we need to do, put the cover on it and Matt will just bring it down to below and put it on the bracket. So mm -hmm. as I said, we don't use that all the time, but it is good. I think it's great to have two. Um, mm. We were in Kangaroo Island and we were using the 15 and it, uh, the prop went and, you know, we had another, we had another, you know, motor, otherwise it would have ruined our cruising. We wouldn't have had a, a motor at all. So um, Matthew's very much into solar and things like that. So we, we are thinking later down the track, you know, would we, as, as technology improves, we'd love to be, um, more self-sufficient and um, use solar a lot more and uh, electric motors and things like that. Mm. But at the moment, this works for us the way it is. And yeah. until we change a few things on the boat, that's probably we'll stick with this until we change some systems on the boat, maybe yeah. lithium batteries and things like that to give us more power. But at the moment, we you, you just make do with what you've got, don't you? Yeah. And the systems that you've got and then see how they go and then you can upgrade them as or change them as you see fit. But so yeah. far... We, um, Matthew's done a, a lot with the communication. He's very much one of those, you know, very good with uh, electronics, elect electronics and systems and um, right. all the systems and nav, you know, software and all of that. So he's very, so he's perfect. And he's a former, he, he was a mechanic by trade. So oh, the two things you want. <laughs> No, he's very good. He's very good at um, fixing things and uh, um, very handy to have on the boat. That's for sure. I couldn't do it without some, with his knowledge. That's for sure. It's one of the key things I find with cruising. We're all asked, aren't we? How much does it cost to go sailing, to go cruising? It's like, well, you know, how long's a bit of string? But my answer is beginning to be what skills do you have? Because that, that's really going to be commensurate with how much you're going to spend. Um, so I'm the same with having a very handy husband, but I expect like me, you really had to learn. So what, what are your handy skills? Uh, my handy skills on the boat, I could ask Matthew that <laughs> as he's in the galley making a curry. My handy skills, I suppose, look, there are pink jobs and blue jobs. You know, there really are. Um, I probably, being X4 deck, um, 
uh, do the obviously the anchoring and the uh, anything on the foredeck. So that it, that's probably my area. Um, and also obviously running the boat inside, keeping the boat you know mm. clean. So they are pink jobs, as I said. My, um, you know, I, I actually like to self steer sometimes. <laughs> you mm. know, we use the autopilot a lot as you as you cruise. Um, I do like to steer sometimes, and sometimes on night watch, I'll you know do a bit of steering yeah. coming through Gladstone through all the um, anchored um, tankers that are all anchored off of um, Gladstone and further down the coast, down New South Wales coast. You know, when I'm going through them over night time, I prefer to self steer, yeah. just keep my wits about me and keep mm. myself awake. So. Um, but as far as my special skills, I don't, I don't know. Matthew's got all the skills, I think. I'm just, uh, I, I can sail a boat. And uh, I think if, I think the thing is also that if anything happened, I'd be able to bring the boat back. I can, you know, I can steer the boat. I can start the boat. I can run the boat. I, I've got my radio license. And I think these are all important things. So it's all good until something goes bad, yes. isn't it? Yeah. And so once something goes bad, if you don't know what to do, yeah. um, I think that's where it becomes unstuck. I think, you know, I know that if we were under sail and Matthew fell over, I could stop the boat. I could go back and get him because I've done all that um, in my training. Um, Fantastic. So, it's so important. Yeah, so, yeah yeah so i think knowing those skills i think i think it's an uh, if as a skipper you'd be in, and i don't want to say you know male and female but as a skipper and you're sailing with your partner um if the other person doesn't know how to stop the boat and turn it around and come back and get you then and i know that there are some situations where that it's, it's, you just can't do that anyway yeah. but at least knowing the basics of how to stop a boat or turn on the engine get the boat started and, and run it and, and so I, I think if you're only two-handed sailing you need to do you need to have those skills yeah. of being of knowing how and and when to call for emergency help and how to do it how um, to do it yeah. i think that's yeah yeah that's all pretty important i was reading a blog post from a friend of mine um, who some of the ladies listening might know on um, Marianne who had a problem on Begonia, their boat coming out of the Tweed Heads and they've written a blog about it. And the interesting thing that came out of that was when her husband was in the back and the, it was all going down and they were, it was terrible. Everything was going wrong as they were being hit by waves. She'd already put in three Mayday calls before the time that he thought that it was time that he should. She'd already, she'd been in touch with VMR at least twice yeah. and then he said you need to call a May day and she's like well you know, <laughs> I've already done, done it. it so it's having that confidence to do that as well and erring on the side of caution I suppose because you can always say no 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 we're okay um, but if something goes wrong knowing what to do I think is important and you need to talk through those things absolutely I'm, I'm right in the middle or at the end of writing my emergency procedures course and it really is a little bit about preventing emergencies but okay if you're faced with it what are you going to do and it's a very interactive scenarios think about this put yourself here what are you going to do right now it's the first thing bang go and every single time i raise the alarm that's raise the alarm to people on board and raise the alarm to someone else because you're absolutely right you can always cancel that call but you may not be able to make that call later. Mm -hmm. A small fire may overtake you later. You might not get to the radio. So it's alerting yeah. someone and your navigation skills give out a position. That's a really important thing. How do I do that? Is it latitude and longitude, mm -hmm. bearing and distance? Skipper has a problem. How am I going to get the boat back? All of those things mm -hmm. are so impo important and people don't think that will happen to them and, and it, it does more often than we realize and I'm very impressed with your friend Mary Ann that's a great story well done Mary Ann if you're listening <laughs> yeah it is a good story yeah well done Mary Ann I hope she listens to this um the other thing also I think Jackie that is is important is um well it has been important to me is that because we've come from racing backgrounds and Matthew's done Sydney to Hobarts and things like that as well mm. and I think it's important we'd have to do a thing called the triple sc and yeah. the, the sea safety survival course and and I, mine's not current at the moment but the learnings from that were incredible um and some clubs for the lincoln race for example we have a thing called safety day and they fire off a few flares you know and ticks and boxes but that's triple sc the actual yachting australia triple sc mandated course i can't recommend highly enough for a it, yes, it is specifically for racing, I suppose, in a way, but the learnings from that 
uh, apply to anyone on a boat at any yes. at any time you know what to do in this situation what to do you know cyclone awareness all of that sort of stuff that you learn in the triple sc um i would recommend if it, if yeah. anyone has the opportunity to do one to do it you learn how hard it is to get in a life raft it's not easy it's the last thing you want to do um so all of those things i think um it's collective knowledge and it all sits back in there and i hope i'll never have to use it uh, yeah exactly and if you do you know what happens when that life raft pops open so um for those listening that that's your sea survival course and th and there are a couple of differences with them um when i worked at tafe i used to teach the, the sea survival for commercial boats there's, there's that that aspect of sea survival which is very similar to the double sc um course but i did that one just a year and a half ago as well and that's sort of another level with the blue water cruising and racing and a bit more for sailboats you sort of taking um, mm -hmm. that into consideration which is another thing mm -hmm. you've got all this equipment on deck and if you're rescued with a helicopter well what are you going to do there's masts and things in the way so the different aspects of it and i i totally agree when you when you plan for this and and have practice it you know what's going to happen like can you can you get your life raft to the rail in 15 seconds? Because that's all you may have. And how are you going to keep that life raft with you? How are you going to get in? Then what you're going to do? And all that, most people don't think about it. We've got the life raft, let's just go. So I, I'm right with yeah. you on that. What and, other and the so, other thing is uh, I also did a, sorry, the, the other thing is um, I did a thing called for the Australian Maritime College called the um, ESS. Uh, elements of shipboard safety and that teaches you about fires and systems and different extinguishers and different things like that which i found again was really really interesting and what you don't realize what you don't know until you yeah. do those courses and you got um so i i just think you know just ex reading and listening to uh, stories and podcasts and uh reading a lot of stories about where things go wrong kind of makes you think about things so um even those disaster stories and coronial inquests i've read a lot of coronial inquests into sea uh, accident, mm. uh, accidents at sea. And you do learn a lot from them as well. So it sounds a bit, you know, grim, but it makes for a fascinating reading. They certainly do. I, when I was working at TAFE teaching there, they, they, when they do those reports, they're quite flashy reports. They're all sort of like a book, aren't they? And, and I'd have them out for my students, you know, read some of these, these are interesting. And most of the students sort of, didn't want to do that but i'd find myself delving into them because you're like i hadn't thought of that you know i hadn't thought of you know if i use the wrong extinguisher i'm actually going to make an explosion in my boat um you know if i if i store things mm. incorrectly i could actually be making yeah. a bomb here you know and it, it, all these things you, you you do have to think about the radio calls and okay someone's gone overboard well now what do i do well, don't chew them up with the propeller for a start, you know, and you're absolutely right. You do need to think of the processes. <laughs> it is grim. Yeah, it is interesting. And, and we don't want to put people off. I mean, cruising is beautiful and it's, it's the most beautiful lifestyle. It's a lovely social, you know, thing to do. And um, it's been our, well, my dream and, and Matthew's dream for a long time and we're finally getting to do it um and probably that's what will be the next few years for us so uh but definitely having those skills and, uh, and those knowledge i mean look in a heartbeat um things can go wrong and i still may make the wrong decision i don't know no one's perfect no one's perfect and you can't you can plan and be prepared but that's not a guarantee but you know what really helped me in my early days of cruising and, and being the newbie and finding it all daunting is is understanding the boat thoroughly, understanding systems, managing the entire boat and knowing what I'd do in an emergency. And I actually enjoyed my cruising life more there because I felt I had that control. And Friday, we don't get overwhelmed with the what ifs. You just stow it away and you've got it. You've got your systems. You know, it, I, I think it helps. I think it helps with seasickness. I really do. Mm. Yeah. So you have a great boat a great life you fulfilled a dream which i think is amazing many people have dreams but to actually fulfill it and do it is is quite something what's been the hard bit what's been the struggle in there uh the struggle has been uh I, i've gone from a um a 30-year career in tv really where i was you know um 40 hours a week 
uh, with deadlines to to produce um, a show every week, um, and that sort of whole TV and news. I was in news for 10, 10 years before that. So that whole uh, corporate, that um, the the busyness, the the intensity, I suppose. And then to I walked away from that four years ago um, for varying reasons, but um, but there, it was time, and I'm glad I did. But then to go from such um, a very busy life where uh, um, it was just full on, I suppose. And now I sit back and it's, it's changed. I don't have that pressure. I'm also not earning the money, obviously, that I was in such a career that I had, but I'm also finding I don't need the money. And I now, you know, like, I don't buy makeup or handbags or shoes or <laughs> the things that I don't buy anymore. Um, and I made a, had a mandate about a year ago when we were looking for the boat after COVID hit and, was like, and it was like, if it doesn't go on the boat, we don't buy it. Mm. And so downsizing and now at the moment, of course, I'm just about to probably purge my house ready to rent that out so we can live on the boat. So, yeah, that's the biggest change, I think, is going from such a high-powered sort of career mindset to the cruising life and just enjoying what's around you. I mean, yeah. we're in Sydney Harbour today. It's been blowing 25 knots. It's still beautiful out there when there's a turtle off the transom. Take the small things now. I, I just yeah. appreciate the small things. And I think you don't know what you can live without until you try. And the things that I thought were possibly important and maybe I was more materialistic just don't. Just don't. And I watch now friends who are on that treadmill and they're, you know, and they're, they've got so much already. They could sell one of their houses and be doing this, yeah. but they're like, oh, you're living the life. It's like, you could be doing this. You're, you're better set up than we were, you know. So don't, you know, I don't know. I think you only live once. And, um, you know, it's, it's said so often, but it's true. Um, I had a story the other day uh, from my mother that really hit home she was my mother's 90 she didn't understand she doesn't she doesn't even swim so she just never ever ever understood the whole yachting thing so um when we said we're taking off she was oh you know stay safe and i think it's terrible you know you're going to come back and she was all a bit like that and uh just last week her hairdresser who she'd known for 30 years died at 50 heart attack yeah. overnight no prayer mm -hmm. you know bang gone and then she rang me and she said i'm so glad you and matthew are doing oh. what you're doing you need to do that you need to oh, do that. Fantastic. So she's done a complete, <laughs> complete Big reversal. Um, yeah, because of, of what happened in the last week. And I think that's what, if everything goes wrong, what do you want to look back and say, well, you never tried it. And I, I think we've just got to do it while you can. And people are going, oh, but you're not working. How, you know, no, I'm not. I'm not working a lot. Um, I'd like to be doing a little bit more, but that's fine. And if, if, if the work comes my way, I'll do it. And if not... We just don't buy steaks. We buy chump chops. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it completely. People say to us, oh, you, you're so lucky. Well, you know, there's not that much luck in it. We made it happen. And, and our early cruising days, we did it on a smell of an oily rag. And that's seen us through many years to building a house. And people sort of say, how do you afford this? Well, we just, we only do what we can and only get what we need. And once you start doing that, you realise actually quite how wealthy you are. It's uh, it's an interesting mindset. I, I've seen much of the same thing. And I think your mum's a marvel. I was going to ask you how she going with you setting off and she sounds like a real diamond at 90 and, and managing to change her opinion on something. That's quite incredible. Yeah, it's completely changed. And oh, she's a 90 with all her marbles. It takes no medication. Wow. I'm hoping I've got her genes. Mm. <laughs> oh, that's marvellous. So do you have any good advice, any advice for someone who's, you know, whether they've got the money or not, that aside, thinking about doing this, okay, I want to go cruising. What could you tell them? Can you sort of wrap that up or some general tips? What would you say to them to help them get there? Um, read, talk to people, get on board as many yachts as you can, go to a club, join a club, talk to people, um, let your enthusiasm infect them, you know, so that then they want to show you on board. And then you can evaluate boats and you can work out what type of boat you want. You can, um, 
you know, work towards your dream while gaining your knowledge. Read everything you can. Um, join, you know, Women Who Sail Australia is, is a fantastic network, I think, of um, like-minded women. I'm really enjoying my time on that forum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, the, and so get onto Facebook or if Facebook's not your thing, then find, read books um, and talk to people and just get part of the community, become part of that community. And I think you'll, you learn by osmosis. You know, uh, the other day I was on a boat and I saw something and I was just like, oh, what a great idea that is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and just instantly apply it. Um, things that people do that you hadn't thought of, you know, it's all about, and it is very social. I'm very social. I'll talk to anyone. Matthew, you know, it's like, oh, you know, do you want to, and, you know, I drag him sometimes to some drinks, but then he'll always enjoy himself. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, if you're thinking of it and you want to sail, don't just have that dream and hold that dream because five years ago I still had the dream but had no idea how I was ever going to get there but by holding the dream yeah. somehow it can happen yeah. um you just meet the right people with the with the right dream yourself um you know there's many men out there that have got boats that are looking for women to sail with them mm -hmm. and there were women out there with boats that are looking to men to sail with them or vice versa or even or, part, or same gender it doesn't matter mm -hmm. you know get out there in the community and find out find your yin to your yang whatever that is yeah. and learn as you go along that's very sage advice. I couldn't agree with you more. And it's a, it's a big learning curve. Like yourself, I'm sure, still learning. I'm still learning. I still learn off other people. I'm, I'm fascinated with these forums and people put scenarios out and seeing different people's opinions. And it's, um, it's the good part of the social media. I love that, that learning from others, yeah. even from a distance. That's really great. Yeah, I do it have... is interesting. Yes. Yeah, it is interesting. And as I said, yeah, go, go, go on. No, that's all right. I'm just going to tell everyone we've got a bit of a delay. I might, uh, yes, a bit of a delay going on. It's, I'm sitting here in southern New South Wales being blown to bits. And um, so we're a fair distance apart. And I think the weather's having an effect, but it's going pretty well. But I, I do want to just go back to your boat briefly. And one challenge people come up with it isn't life or death but they have a boat and they want to rename it and and noel and i have renamed our boats but we have the creativity of a gnat i think because it was you know pie whack it and then it became pie whack it too you know it's like oh god uh, we had too much other stuff to think about but you guys have got this beautiful name that i'd like you to tell us about i just really love this Uh, okay, when we bought the boat, and this is no disrespect to Dale who had the boat, but her name was Sukha, S-U-K-A-H, um, which is Sanskrit uh, for happiness or bliss, and which was sounded lovely. It's also, as Dale found out along the track, and as we found out when we spoke to our Norwegian friends, it also is a Russian, uh, our Finnish friends, I should say, um, it's also a Russian name for a woman of loose morals. <laughs> so, oh, I didn't see well, that part. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so so when I found that out I was just like and I wanted I knew that I would probably have a blog and uh, a Facebook page or something for the boat and I, I just went and and when our fin Finnish friends they were they just laughed and they said you know what that means don't you <laughs> and we're like no what does that mean and they're laughing and then we found out and we, and we went back to Dale and he said oh that yes we I did hear that and that would be why um, a, a Russian woman once said to me you must not like your boat very much <laughs> he said so <laughs> so anyway so we, yes we decided to rename and what to name her and so she's a big boat she's when I say big she's not massive but she's 47 foot so she's not tiny um so and she, she's a Catalina so I'm thinking Spanish names and women's names and Matt's going nah, 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 nah. and then we went back to our friends in Finland and said well what do you think and so they came back with the name Velamo and Velamo, when I Googled it on Wikipedia, is the uh, Finnish goddess of the sea, the wind and the waves. She's tall, regal, beautiful, um, and kind mm. to sailors. And, um, and there's a beautiful description there. And then I started researching images of Velamo and the old mythology around Velamo. And I just loved it. I, and I just knew straight away. And I just said to Matt, that's, that's our boat. So we've given her a name and on our transom, her... Um, well, that's sorry, I can't say it there. Um, but her actual logo that I de designed or had designed um, has the Finnish flag through it as well, in the as a testament to Finland yes. itself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's got the which is white with a blue cross, 
and um, well, there's our AIS going off over there. Oh, I thought, um, the, I thought the courier yeah. was ready, that Matthew was uh, No, no, cooking. that's... Uh, that's <laughs> That's as we're spinning around on anchor. We've obviously just come close to a boat or someone's going past. Um, so just wait for Matt to clear it. Mm. Okay, there we go. Um, so we named her Velamo because of the Finnish goddess of the sea and the description on Wikipedia just sold me. It's a beautiful description and, uh, and the logo, as I said, and uh, it suits her. She's, you know, some mm. people say Velamo, Velamo, um, it doesn't really matter. It suits her. We think it suits her and uh, we're happy with it. And Matthew has a long uh, love of Scandinavian countries. And so, and I've been to Sweden as well. Mm. And uh, so uh, it suited us. So that's why. And that's how yes. we came up with us. Wonderful. And there's not many. And, and when you look on marine traffic, there's no, not many Velamos. So no, nobody, it's, it's a bit unique like that too, which I like. And and relatively short, really. That nice when you're phonetic spelling, nice and yeah, nice and short. That's uh, that's a consideration too. No, it really, it's easy, easy, easy on the radio. That was a, definitely a consideration. I saw a boat here the other day that had a name that I couldn't even say, let alone yeah. phonetically use on the radio. I just I do wonder sometimes. But no, Velamo is easy to say, uh, easy to remember. So it suits us, and that's that's what we came up with. Mm, that's a really lovely story. I, I really like that. And I think, you know, another tip, there's some great tips here today. That's really great. And, and that is another tip with changing your name. Think about how you're going to say it, especially in emergency conditions and knowing your phonetic alphabet. And, and that story is on mm. your blog. Yes, no, just go. That's your blog for everyone if they want to have uh, a look. Have I put it on there? I don't know. I told you I haven't given it a lot of love. There's a few stories in there. Um, there's a few stories I in there. I think that one or not. Yeah, I think the boat description's on there, I think. But it, the, you've got some some of your travels in there and your writing is extraordinary. I just got really caught up in it last night and reading some oh, of your articles. You. Yeah, I really enjoyed it and your your honesty and down to earth and, and just you could feel your vibrancy come through and your love of life. It's uh, it, it had me really smiling and I, I sort of got to the end and went, Tracy, we need <laughs> some more. You. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been remiss. In, in fact, I have written, um, I write for, uh, I wrote an article uh, about when we bought the boat, uh, but I haven't actually even uploaded and it's terrible. I've got, I've got the document. We, I'm always taking video. I'm always taking photographs. Mm. The story is there to tell. I just haven't uploaded it. I, I've got to yeah. give my blog, yes, no, just go a bit more love. Um, but we do put a lot on our Facebook page for Velamo, so yeah. people could follow the that and uh, on Instagram as uh, that some of the video that we're creating. So, but I'm not going to go down the YouTube track. <laughs> no, I think I think you're wise. There's there's some, some great YouTubers out there. Um, I was glad we sort of did our cruising before all this happened because I, I know I would have got sucked into it or, or an ele you know, hadn't really taken off. There's an element of it. And doing the blogs and the photography is a job in itself. That's still, I understand why yeah. you haven't put it up. It's, it's still another job. Now I could. Well, it's, it's, I, I actually probably, there's, there's actually no excuse really when I was a, I mean, I was a TV producer producing, you know, half an hour of stories that are informative travel stories every week for 10 years. So the skill set certainly there, yeah. but oh, yeah. I suppose because I did do it for so long for channel seven, to me, it's, it's uh, even though I've got the skill set, it, it's just getting my head in the right space to do it because then yeah. it seems like work. So mm. anyway, no, I know what you but, mean. Uh, I think my Mac's going to uh, run out of batteries too. So I'm going to wrap up soon because I, I could talk to you for ages. Honestly, I really could chat to you for ages. Just lastly, what, what would you, what should I ask you that I haven't already? What do you want to be asked? Is there something, is there a message you want to put out there? Uh, well, I think some of the questions that you've asked other people is what would you be doing if you in a perfect life if you weren't on a sailboat? And I like that question. I thought that was a great question. Um, you know, if you could, if you went back through your life and you weren't sailing, what would you, what would, what, are, what else could you be doing? And I thought that was going to really interesting. I had to ponder that one for a while. Good. And, um, and I think it was interesting if I wasn't sailing and I didn't have that love of the ocean, I know exactly where I would be. And that would be, 
I would have horses because oh. I was raised with horses. My father was a horseman. My father trained race horses. I grew up with horses. I had horses and probably until about 16, 17, always had my own horses and then discovered nightclubs and boys and didn't have a horse after that, um, you know, because I was there. Then I was traveling a lot too. So I couldn't really look after a horse, but my childhood was all about horses. So I would hope that I'd be on a farm somewhere with some horses. That would probably be my other happy place other than being on the ocean. I am amazed. So many people I speak to that love boats, love horses. It just seems to be a common thread. I don't know whether it's something to do with the adrenaline, the excitement, but um, well, if you, if you, when you come south and you, this time when you come south this way, you have to come and see my horses. I'm the same. Absolutely. I would love to come and see your horses. I've been looking at your posts and I'm thinking, well, that's my other life. And that's why when you said that, I was like, that is, that, that would be what I would do. I'd be in the country with horses. I'd probably be in the country and I'd have to see the ocean nearby or yeah. have water nearby though. Cause I'm a Piscean and the, it's, I have to see water in some way, shape or form. Uh, but yeah, horses definitely. Oh, that's wonderful. That's good to know. We have had very parallel lives, you and I. That's really interesting. And <laughs> <laughs> I think you've been amazing. I think what you're doing is amazing. That curry smells fantastic. Can you tell Matt that? <laughs> that's that's really there. great. I yeah. wish I was there I for dinner. The... Hang on. Hang on. Can I see? There you go. Hang on. There it is oh, on the nice. stove. Oh, yep. fantastic. Oh, that looks great. Yep. Oh, loving the boat. Bit of a, there's, a, there's a bit of a look around. Oh, so. oh great. She's lovely. You've done really well. Yeah, she is lovely. She yeah. is lovely. We're really happy with her and, and we're continually impressed with her. Um, and we're still getting to know her. We've only, you know, it's only really been, a, a, you know, not even a, a year really. So we're still getting to know her, but she's beautiful. She's a great boat. Um, there's only seven of them in Australia. So unfortunately, I don't think they've come up for sale very often, but they're great boats. Yeah, that's fantastic. It does take a while to get to know them completely. I think it took us um, half the planet until we managed to sail our first boat properly. So um, it took us <laughs> took us a fair while. I'm going to let you go. It's been absolutely amazing to talk to you. And we may do this again down the line because I think we have so much to talk about. There's your photography, all the other oh. things you've done, your travelling. Um, it's incredible. Your pictures are amazing. I went on Instagram and, and um, you do a, a lovely job there. You can see the professionalism in them. And oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's on the Velamo Instagram page. Thank you. Mm, yeah. So I'll put all your contacts up on our website. Um, this will go out. I'll, I'll share it with you and the world and we'll put some pictures up as well. And I think... We shall leave it at that for now in case you suddenly disappear on me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Enjoy. you for the chat, Jack. It was lovely to talk with you. Thank I you should... for the invitation to talk. And um, and obviously I, the, the, whoever listens to this, if they see the boat, come and say hello. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, that's lovely. Thanks, Tracy. And we'll have fun on Anchor and we'll talk to you again soon.